Hey, welcome to avionicseducation.com. In this episode, we're going to talk about one of the most important tools an avionics technician has in their toolbox, and that's going to be the multimeter. Hello everybody and welcome back to my avionics education channel on YouTube. Now I know many people say when they have, <clears throat> when they haven't been on YouTube in a while and they haven't produced a video in a while and then they want to remind the viewer that, hey, I'm sorry I haven't done a video in a while. Well, I'm not going to insult you with that. Uh, because I haven't done a video in a while and I'm so sorry for that. For this segment of avionics education, I want to start talking about some of those essential tools that are used by an avionics technician. So the first tool that I do want to cover on this site, because it is avionics education after all, is the multimeter. Now, if there is one tool that closely defines an avionics technician, that's the multimeter. This is the mainstay toolbox item for anybody who works around electronics or avionics in an aircraft. Now, I still have my first multimeter that I've had over 30 years ago at my first airline job. Now, this was a personal tool. I kept it in my tool bag, and it was marked by the airlines for troubleshooting only because it was not calibrated by the airline. Now, we're going to talk about some rules of using a simple multimeter in this first section, and that'll bring us to the first rule of multimeters when it talks about calibration. So the first rule of using a multimeter is that you cannot use a multimeter for return to service unless it's actually been calibrated. Now, what do I mean? Well, if I'm going to use a multimeter to set a voltage to validate uh, an amperage to go through and to, to measure a specific amount uh, in ohms, amps, or volts, then the meter I use, and this is for civil aircraft, must be calibrated to a known standard, to source. And that's when you work for an airline or you work for uh, a repair station, that's one of the big uh, control items that they have in the repair station is the control of these tools. However, I can use this personal tool on an aircraft for troubleshooting purposes, meaning that if I just want to go to an aircraft and find out what's wrong, then I could go through and use this meter just to give me an idea of where to evaluate or what to change or what to try out in my troubleshooting process, especially when it comes to locating a broken wire in an aircraft. Uh, and that's some other uses for troubleshooting. I could use it to test the output of a generator and alternator on a GA aircraft, or I could use it to measure the load uh, on a heater, or I could use it to measure if a heater uh, is cost continuity through it, or um, or I could use it to troubleshoot a, a transformer or a relay. There's all sorts of uses that I can use to troubleshoot an aircraft with a multimeter. Now, when it comes time to changing the components, fixing a wire, or if I have to go through, say, a good example is uh, doing an, an autopilot yaw damper system. On an older style aircraft, there was a specific measurement that you had to get from a multimeter on the box. Well, that requires a calibrated tool to return to service. So that's our first rule. You only use a multimeter that is calibrated to return an aircraft to service. So, but tr personal multimeters, if they're under control in a good shape and they're well taken care of, can be used for troubleshooting. A multimeter is a multifunction tool which means that most meters in a mechanics toolbox can perform many different actions. Uh, this is an example of a flight line meter that I've used for many years working for the airlines and as a mechanic in general aviation. It's water resistant, has a shock proof case, and it's easy to use and read. Now, some newer models even have backlighting built in and a tone generator, a tone, uh, sometimes a tone generator built in uh, to, to help hear circuits when you're doing troubleshooting. The meter shown here is an example of a digital multimeter, aka DMM. This particular model is auto-ranging. Now, auto-ranging means that when I connect the voltmeter or ammeter function to do a test, 
the internal circuits will test at the highest setting automatically before adjusting its internal ranging to get a reading that's, that I'm looking for. So for example, if I want to see a circuit that should be outputting five millivolts, I would connect the meter and the meter will start at the 100 volt range first before automatically adjusting its internal ranging to get close to my five millivolt target. Setting the meter brings us to another rule about multimeters. So in this particular talks about analog meters. When testing a circuit with a meter that does not have auto range function, the technician will need to set the meter to the highest scale before selecting a lower scale to achieve that mid scale reading. So what it means is that uh, if I don't set, my, particularly to analog meters, if I don't set it to the highest reading, then the meter will automatically peg off scale which, if enough voltage is applied, could damage the meter. In the worst case, it would actually affect its calibration. Today's modern digital multimeters are much more forgiving, uh, which means that, again, they're auto-ranging. We just have to make sure that when we connect it, we understand the polarity. That talks about how do we connect a voltmeter in the circuit. We'll get to that in a second. Because I do want to talk about one other thing about selecting a, more, a voltmeter or a multimeter function. A closely associated rule to the range selection is to ensure that the meter that you use is rated higher than the voltage that you want to test. Now you can find this information in the meter's specification sheet. For example, for my classic Fluke 21, 1000 volts DC and 750 volts AC. So if I need to test a circuit with a higher voltage, I would need to find another meter that's rated for a much higher voltage, say 500 or 1000 volts. Now my 250 volt uh, output meter was perfect for an air carrier aircraft system that operated nominally about 200 and uh, 220 volts RMS and AC. Now a multimeter may have extra functions, but for a line technician, it really has three essential tasks. A voltmeter, both AC and DC, an ohmmeter, and an ammeter. Now each function will require different methods to connect to the circuit to test. So let's go over the voltmeter first. To use the voltmeter function to be able to connect it, first of all you need to select on the meter whether you want to measure AC or DC. And that has a lot to do with how the meter will display it. For example, my meter is a volts RMS, which means that when I'm selecting volts AC, I get a root mean square value. If I have a DC reading, it'll read the peak voltage of DC. Now to read voltage on this any circuit, you need to connect the leads to the correct uh, polarity. Uh, most aircraft in the United States operate on the negative ground concept, which means that, that we connect the black lead negative to some sort of common ground. Uh, this could be earth ground, earth ground again, or could be an aircraft frame or structure or another grounding post. One thing about, so, but you want to be able to connect this to your negative lead. Then I want to connect the other positive to whatever, whatever I want to measure. If it's off a terminal board, for example, there's examples in an aircraft where I could take my positive lead, select it to volts AC, and then read between the terminal, grow, a terminal board post and ground and read what voltage I want to see. So the rule about reading voltage on a meter is that you're going to read across a load item when you're testing it. What I mean by that is that it can only read across a resistance load. This could be an individual resistor in a circuit, for example, if I have a simple board and I want to read the voltage drop across any one resistor, so I just go from one side of the resistor to the other and I could read voltage. Or I could read it from the one side of the battery to the ground to see if the battery is charging or discharging. These are all ways that I would read voltage. I cannot read voltage across a solid conductor. And this happens on occasion to where a technician will grab the negative lead, put it to ground, and then try to find uh, another wire or a post 
to read off of and come only to find out, oh, that's got zero volts on there. Uh, and they go through further, that particular terminal is actually another ground. So a ground to a ground would give you no load across it, and obviously it would be zero voltage. There would be nothing wrong with that connection because you're not measuring the correct thing. So that was the critical part about using a voltmeter. A voltmeter is read across any load. The second function of most multimeters is the ammeter. An ammeter measures the amount of current in a conductor. Another term for that is measuring the load of the conductor. So what it's doing is that the ammeter must be placed in the circuit, where the ammeter itself becomes part of the circuit. So to be able to connect an ammeter into uh, into something you want to test, for example, the output of an alternator, you need to disconnect that lead from the alternator, connect it one lead to the ammeter, the other lead to the post that you just disconnected, and then run the run the system to see the load coming around. The reason why this works is the reason why the ammeter has to be part of the system is because of the way it works. An ammeter actually has an internal uh, sensing device called a shunt. A shunt is nothing more than a calibrated or very sensitive uh, resistance load inside there. Uh, this brings us to another rule about ammeters. Make sure that when you connect an ammeter to any load or any uh, current current amperage that you don't use the wrong selection. Reason being is be that there may be multiple ammeter shunts in here that that are graded for different voltages or different loads. You may have one that's designed to go up to say 20 amps versus one that should that in fact this one here is 300 milliamps. There's a second connection on this one. The reason for this is because the larger the shunt, the the more current it can measure. However, because it is a resistance value, albeit as little as possible, it does affect the operation of the circuit because we are adding resistance to the circuit. So you want to be able to use the lowest ammeter shunt setting or the lowest ammeter function that you could when testing uh, to testing your loads or testing your amps. So that's another rule about that is making sure that you connect the ammeter to the correct load. Now there's not much in the way of adjustment. An ammeter just simply in this particular one, if I have a 300 uh, millivolt rom, uh, millivolt section that connects to this lead, and then I have, I'll roll it over here, I have uh, ammeter measures amps AC and another one measures amps DC. And I'll show a close picture of that. So to remember, to connect an ammeter in a circuit, the meter must be placed into the circuit. It becomes as part of the aircraft circuit, which means when you're connecting it, uh, you always want to make sure you take the proper precautions. I use clips that are insulated because if I disconnect a wire, I don't want to hold both ends of the wire and the meter at the same time. I want to set it up to where I could uh, connect both leads of the ammeter and then be assured that if I run the system, I don't have to touch it, that it could go ahead and run safely without grounding itself out. So ammeters themselves can be somewhat, somewhat dangerous to use. Uh, and this is the reason why a lot of larger aircraft will have what's called a load meter. When you see a load meter in an aircraft, it's just another term for an meter. And the beauty of that is that it lets the, uh, it lets the pilot and the mechanic know how much load is being generated through when you turn on certain systems. For example, if I have a problem with a transformer rectifier in an aircraft, I could go through and use the load meter and to see if it's actually drawing more amperage than normal, which means we have a problem. So that is something that you could use an ammeter for, to troubleshoot functioning items that use a heavy load, for example. The third primary function of a typical multimeter is to measure resistance. The ohmmeter function is done by placing a small calibrated DC voltage across an item to be tested. So the way it does this is that the current will flow through the item being tested. The meter knows what DC voltage it's applied and it simply uses ohm's law to determine ohms. 
So an ohmmeter can be used for a lot of functions. I can measure resistance in a coil, uh, in a resistor. I can validate the continuity of wire. Uh, that's a lot of things I could do to test an ohmmeter. That brings us to a couple of interesting rules about using an ohmmeter. The first and foremost, an ohmmeter really should never be used on a live aircraft. If I'm troubleshooting a wire in an aircraft, that aircraft needs to be completely powered down. And I don't mean just the system that I'm troubleshooting. I mean, if I'm searching for a broken wire in an aircraft and I'm disconnecting cannon plugs and connectors in the aircraft, I want a cold, dark aircraft. Because I just don't know, even though I may shut off the system I'm troubleshooting, I just don't know what else is running power. So a rule of using a ohmmeter to trace a broken wire is to have the aircraft cold, dark. That brings us to the next rule is that a multimeter, uh, an ohmmeter rather, should only measure an object that's isolated from any other circuit. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I have a resistor on the table, I could use the two ends of the ohmmeter and read the resistance directly. But if I had this same resistor put in a circuit, well, remember, it was with any circuit, current will always take the path of least resistance. So should a component still be installed in a circuit? Well, most of the voltage from the meter will find its way to the smaller resistance path. This will make it impossible to validate the correct item or the value of the unit that you're being measured because so much of that calibrated voltage is going elsewhere on the circuit. And that brings us to another final danger of using an ohmmeter in a complete circuit. And I've actually seen this being done with people that are probing a circuit board. If you think about a circuit board, circuit boards have, you know, might have a microprocessor on it. And it may have tiny uh, uh, diodes on it and transistors on it. Things that are only rated to operate maybe at most one or two volts. I know that for operating on a chip, some inputs to the chip are limited to millivolts. So what can happen though, if I'm probing a circuit board with a five volt power supply trying to read resistance on a board and I put that five volts in something that's designed to operate in the millivolt range. Um, nothing good could happen, I can tell you. It would burn it up. So always ensure that the object being tested is isolated from any other part of the circuit. Now this might require that the item be completely removed from, from the board, the circuit, or the aircraft that you're testing about it. When using a voltmeter, make sure you always use a voltmeter that's rated to the largest voltage that you're going to be measuring. Always, when you're using a, a voltmeter, connect across a load that you want to measure. A voltmeter also be ensured that you keep the polarities going. Now again, digital multimeters are pretty forgiving, but we do want to protect it and make sure we keep our polarities correct. In other words, positive, positive, negative, negatives, which means you're going to have to think about as a technician, if I'm, if I'm looking across a component, which way is the current going from the load to the ground? For ammeters, again, rules about ammeters. Make sure that the ammeter is rated for the amperage being tested. And on most ammeters, again, we'll have a multiple function choice. Make sure that you use the correct either setting for the ammeter or the, even the extra lead for the ammeter if there is section. Also on an ammeter, make sure that you separate your AC and your DC tests. Make sure that you function. Same thing for voltmeter. Rules about ohmmeters. Ohmmeters, the best way to troubleshoot a broken wire in an aircraft is in a cold, dark aircraft. In other words, remove all power from the aircraft. Another rule about ohmmeters is to completely isolate whatever you want to test. In other words, don't have them any connected to any part of the uh, the rest of the circuit. Just to be sure you know exactly where your calibrated voltage from the ohmmeter is going. So, and the other thing I always talk about taking care of your uh, your your multimeter, especially if it's even if it's a personal tool, protect it. Don't leave it out in the sun. Don't leave it out in the rain. Don't let it get too hot. And just when you're using a multimeter, always remember to turn it off in the end. Remember, these things have batteries in them. You want to make sure you change the batteries out from time to time just to make sure that they don't explode inside the case. Uh, like I said, 
I've actually checked this one against a new one, and it's still within 5% of being within calibration. And this that's where these digital meters are so great. Don't pick the cheapest one, but also you don't have to pick the most expensive one. You just have to pick one that's probably rugged and, and viable for what you're doing for your job. If you want to know more information about using a multimeter, how to care for a multimeter, especially when we're talking about some of the calibration techniques, you could find that information in my Avionics Technician Handbook, Volume 1. In that book, you'll learn about the requirements for calibration, and again, civil, civil aircraft, some examples of troubleshooting components, like how to find a broken wire or how to troubleshoot individual components can be found in that book. You can find that book on my website, avionicseducation.com, uh, or at Amazon. Now, I'll place the links in the description below. So thanks for listening to this little mini session on how to be an avionics technician. In future videos, I'll begin describing other meters and signal generators, all that we use to maintain aircraft as avionics technicians. If you like this video, please hit uh, subscribe and share. And to be notified of new videos on it, don't forget to subscribe. So until next time, keep it safe.